Hello, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 44. My name's Andy and today I want to talk to you about undefined behavior. Um, so if you've been writing only safe Rust, you pretty much don't have to think about undefined behavior. You almost never see it in safe Rust. But if you're writing unsafe Rust, uh, you'll get told this could cause undefined behavior if you don't follow the rules, right? Um, if you follow the rules, um, as in if you follow the documentation around an unsafe function or trait, um, or some unsafe bit of um, pointer stuff that you're doing, uh, then you won't get undefined behavior. Um, but if you don't manage to follow the rules or misunderstand them or something, you could get undefined behavior. So I want to talk about what undefined behavior is to give you some kind of intuition for why this happens. It's not just that the compiler gets cross with you for not doing what you told it to, so it punishes you. Um, it's that the compiler... Uh, trusts you um, that you've done it right and sometimes that means when you haven't done it right unexpected things happen right so let's try and get into it so here's an example uh, of an unsafe function called unreachable unchecked um, and what that means is if you call that function which is unsafe so you'd have to call it in an unsafe block yourself to say yes I've read the rules and I'm following them um, if you call that function, the compiler is allowed to assume that you will you will never reach that bit of the code. Um, yeah, so the program has to check the preconditions. So the program has to check that you never will reach that code. Um, also, just as a side point, uh, the return value of this function is an exclamation mark, which is pronounced never, uh, and it means uh, th this function will never return. So like an infinite loop or something else, technically called diverging. Okay, um, so here's an example of using unreachable unchecked. So uh, imagine we're doing something expensive, uh, which always gives us the same answer. That's what pure means here. Um, and we know, because we are smart people who wrote this clever computation, that the answer will never be zero. So we've written this if... And we've said, uh, if it does come out of zero, print me some like debugging stuff to say, shouldn't have got here. And then we can tell the compiler, you will never actually get here because the, the output from this function can never be zero. In fact, um, we'll, we'll always do this different computation thing instead. Um, so because this is unreachable, uh, the compiler knows you can't have done, you can't be doing this either. Um, yeah, that's just a highlight that. Yeah. So because we said that the, this whole branch of stuff is unreachable and there's no branching in that print statement, it means that that print statement can never happen. Like the compiler looks at that. It believes what you said. You said that's unreachable. So it looks back and it says, okay, well, if they don't reach that, they don't reach this print either. So it's as if the print isn't there. But actually there's even more to it than that. Um, so we can just delete the print, but also, um, we can delete this whole branch of the if. So it's equivalent to just deleting the if and just saying, do the expensive pure computation, um, compare it to zero, but it, that, that doesn't do anything, and then do your other thing, the other thing that was in the else of the if, because um, there's no need for the if, because we know that it never gets in there. And actually, we can go even further than that. Because this function is pure, meaning that it always gives you the same answer, we don't even need to run this function. We certainly don't need to compare the answer with zero. So you can actually completely delete all the rest of the stuff and just change the code into different computations. So this is just an example of the kind of reasoning that the compiler might do if you um, use uh, unreachable unchecked. And generally, how, the kind of reasoning the compiler might do if it knows stuff about your code, um, it can make it can take all those assumptions and delete a whole load of work that otherwise would have to happen at runtime. So this is an, like an excellent thing the compiler might do. It's not something that the compiler is guaranteed to do, by the way. Um, so you might be comparing, you might be running that expensive function uh, computation and comparing it with zero, or you might not. You don't know. That's why it's undefined. Um, or you know, the uncertainty here is why the behavior is undefined and not just defined to be something different. Um, but yeah, so it, can you imagine now the compiler transforms this block of code into just this bit, 
But actually, we made a mistake. An expensive pure computation sometimes can return zero. So this is untrue, this thing we told the compiler, that it's unreachable. Uh, well, the behavior in that case, if the compiler did these optimizations, is indeed confusing, because actually, it will just do this. And it will never check this thing that you were wrong about, um, that the pure computation return never returns zero. So, um, and you won't, uh, critically here, you won't get your hello there debugging statement. Uh, so you'll be really, potentially, be really confused about what's going on. So this is just an example of, if you, um, if you tell the compiler something, in this case we told the compiler that that statement was unreachable, they would never get executed, and we were wrong, uh, we broke our promise to the compiler that we'd read the instructions and followed them. So the instructions around unreachable unchecked are, it should be impossible to get here and run this thing. Uh, so we broke the rules, and the behavior of the program is now undefined. So undefined behavior, uh, it could it could run code that looks like this, or it could just run code that looks like this, or something else. Um, we don't know what it's going to do because we've broken the rules. If we follow all the rules, we can be sure that the behavior will be equivalent to um, the code we wrote. If we don't follow the rules, all bets are off. Um, and like the joke is that it might launch rockets. That's the phrase that people sometimes use. Um, but certainly, um, you just don't know. In this case, we can be quite well defined about what might happen. Like it, it might, it might print that thing or it might not. Um, it's probably not going to do something else like launch rockets. But in a lot of cases, because we're dealing with memory that might be uninitialized, um, like you genuinely can't predict what the computer's going to do. Um, yeah, so that was uh, an example of something that is quite uh, easy to understand. We can understand how we might fool the compiler and what the compiler might do um, if it's fooled. Um, but in practice, most of the stuff is much more complicated than this. So, for example, let's create a reference, um, a reference to a U8. Um, but then inside this unsafe block, we're dereferencing a pointer. So this is the thing that's, that needs us to have an unsafe block. Uh, dereferencing a pointer and putting that into this, uh, this reference, which is called reference. But you can see there's a bug in this code because, um, references can never be zero, can never be null. But we're putting a zero, turning it into a pointer to U8 and then dereferencing it to make a reference to a U8. Um, so we've lied to the compiler or we got, we, you know, we've made a mistake. We're not following the rules we said we were following when we created this unsafe block and said, yes, I've read the documentation. I've followed the rules. And the compiler can assume that reference is never null when it generates code. And um, this is some LLVM, so internal compiler, partway compiled code, illustrating that there's this non-null thing here and here, uh, meaning that the compiler has made the assumption that the reference is not null. And that could mean it could make all kinds of assumptions in future uh, like, for example, it could delete a null check and just say, no, nope, that will never come out um, true because um, it, it, it will never be null, but actually it is null. Or all kinds of other stuff could happen. It will be, it will happily um, go look up that memory at, at address zero, uh, which would be a bad idea. So that's just another example of how undefined behavior happens. So a compiler might do something or might produce code that does something unexpected. Um, because we were wrong, we said we'd read the docs and followed the instructions, and we didn't. All right, so let's look at transmute. So transmute, uh, std mem transmute is a another uh, unsafe function. You have to guarantee it that um, you're following the rules, um, and you can transmute an i64 into an f64. Uh, so transmute means take the byte representation of an i64 and just understand it as if it was an F64. And we happen to know that they, I64 and F64 contain the same number of bytes. Um, but like what that means is, um, in, in the general case, uh, completely unpredictable. Like uh, an integer um, made out of 64 bits has quite a easy to understand layout in memory. Uh, a floating point, it has a, it has a, a well-defined representation in memory, but it's totally different. Uh, it's like in scientific notation with some part of it is the, the bits after the decimal point and some part of it is how many 
zeros effectively you're putting in, in your number. Um, so t can, treating one as the other might well produce um, a number that doesn't actually make sense as a number at all, or uh, who knows what. So part of the rules, I just read this before I started recording, part of the rules of transmute are that both the number you started with and the number you finished with must be valid. So it, the only f numbers you can pass in to this transmute function with I I64, F64, are numbers which are valid I64s on the way in, but when they've been transmuted, the answer is a valid F64 on the way out. And if you give it a, a number that is not a valid F64 on the way out, uh, you will have undefined behavior. The, the compiler won't check it, or the, the, the code that the compiler produces won't check it. It will assume you've got a valid F64 when you haven't. Uh, or it might check it, or it might do something else. Like it's completely undefined what it does. You're only allowed to give it I64s that can be seen as F64s. By the way, the situation where you'd be most likely to do that would be if it was somehow it was an F64 or earlier, um, and you transmuted it the other way, and that's why you know it's a valid F64 now, something like that. Um, but uh, it's worth making the point that transmute doesn't just like do the wrong thing in every case. So there's still plenty of checking. So for example, in this case... Um, you can't transmute an I64 into an F32 because like, it's very easy for the compiler to say, no, that's got the wrong number of bytes, the wrong number of bits. So, um, it will refuse to do that at compile time. So it's not like all your checking is gone when you're doing unsafe code. Um, but you have to read the docs, make sure you follow the rules that they give you. And in this case, this rule is a particularly difficult one to follow, I think. Um, and it, things can get even worse, right? So, um, uh, Rust has a thing which other, some other languages don't have, which is that, um, if you have a bool um, stored in a byte, so a boolean, which is either true or false, then the only things that are allowed to be in that piece of memory are either zero, this is just like a way of saying in binary a load of zeros, eight zeros, either zero or one, right? Those are the only things that a bool can be. A lot of languages let it be anything non-zero is counts as true or something like that, but in this case, it's either zero for false or one for true, and that's it. So if you take a the number two stored in a byte, a U byte, and you transmute it into a bool, you're basically telling the compiler, treat this number that I'm giving you as if it's a bool. But the compiler knows a bool can only ever be zero or one. And you're giving it, you're giving it a two. Now it doesn't transmute, it doesn't look at it at all. It just says, okay, I now know I've been promised that this is a valid bool, so I'm going to treat it as a valid bool. So they're giving us a great example here of what might, how that might go wrong. So, um, uh, they might make a jump table, which means, um, something that tells you where, like what address you're going to jump to. Um, so this is a mach uh, machine code instruction, assembly language instruction, jump. Um, and they're saying jump to either this memory address, like start executing code at this memory address or at this memory address. And then they, the way they choose where we're jumping to is by looking up in that jump table um, with this bool value. So this bool value should be either a zero or a one. So it's valid to look it up in the table. Either the, a zero will take us to this address or a one will take us to this address. But if bool value was actually two, it would look beyond the end of the memory of jump table at some random piece of memory here. And that's why you can see why you get undefined behavior because who knows what's in that memory address after the stuff in this jump table. So it's just an example, another example of how um, if you break the promises you made to the compiler, the, uh, the compiler won't check them for you when you're doing unsafe code. It assumes that you've told it the truth and really unexpected, unpredictable things can happen um, if, you, if you make a mistake and you're not following the rules you thought you were following. So all this leads us to the question of, is Rust just as bad as C, uh, or C++, or some other unsafe language? Um, in Rust, you can do stuff which breaks memory safety. So how is Rust any better than C? And the main answer to that is, um, quite often you can write your Rust program without writing any unsafe code at all. Uh, and you're off, But often you're relying on code in a library or something like that, which is unsafe. But that code has been really carefully checked. Generally, standard libraries in programming languages are pretty high quality, and they work pretty well. Um, so the point is, you, you can have a reasonable amount of confidence that the unsafe code you're relying on is correct, and then you can write a lot of safe code. 
But even more than that, if you get into unsafe code because you need to do something tricky, uh, Rust gives you the ability to do that, to do stuff as tricky as you like, um, and to like check it carefully. But the difference from doing that in a language like C or C++ is that the surface area of code that you have to check extra carefully to make sure it's correct is so much smaller than it is in a language like C or C++ where any line of code might be the code that has a mistake in it. Now, tra tracking down a crash or some other weird behavior caused by um, a mistake in some unsafe code might mean that you crash in all kinds of different areas of the code, right? It's not going to be like straightforward and easy. The whole point is undefined behavior is unpredictable. But your bug is going to involve um, your um, the assumptions that you thought you were following or the rules you said you were following when you wrote unsafe code being violated. It must do. So even though you might, your reasoning might need to take in other code, the surface area is definitely going to include um, the unsafe code you wrote, the code that you wrote within that unsafe block that says, I read the docs and I, I'm following the rules. So it's so much easier to track down uh, where your mistake is. Uh, and often um, you can rewrite code um, as safe um, just a little bit slower than the unsafe version. Um, so you can, if you're really stuck, you can just get rid of a bit of unsafe code that you suspect might be the problem, um, replace it with some safe code, and that will validate uh, your, uh, your assumptions. Uh, and then if it stops crashing, then you, you can think, okay, it really, the problem really is with this bit of unsafe. So like the, the, just the attack surface or the, the surface of code that you need to consider and think, is this correct? is so much smaller. Um, so that's awesome. Plus, I mean, the real reason why it's so great is most of the time you don't have to worry about any of this unsafe stuff and you just won't get any of this weird undefined behavior. Okay. So here's what we've got to so far with unsafe and um, undefined behavior. So Rust is a systems language and it does provide you the ability to step outside of the guardrails and do these dangerous things. Um, there are places where you just have to do that, like calling code in a different language where you don't know whether it's following your rules or not, uh, connecting uh, closely with the operating system or the hardware, or to make your code faster um, because you can do something as a human that you inspect and know it's safe, um, but the compiler is a bit cautious about it. Um, so Rust goals of safety mean that we do restrict access to uh, this dangerous stuff into these unsafe blocks. Um, but the unsafe block gives us this escape hatch. Um, you have the power to do anything you want to do, but you have this risk that undefined behavior might happen. All right. So that is, um, that was, um, undefined behavior. Um, next time we're going to continue looking at unsafe, um, looking at just like, like some classes and struct, some structs and, and types that you'll end up using, uh, if you're doing unsafe code and try and dig into some examples and it's going to get pretty deep. So we'll see how we get on. Uh, thanks for watching. See you next time.